Okay. Good morning, everybody. And I would say good morning to the European people, but also maybe a good night for the uh, US and Canadian people who join us. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, in the name of Maria Giorgio, my co-animator, um, and uh, myself to the uh, ERC Virtual Congress and to this free paper session, uh, both on pediatrics and uh, new technologies. We will start with our first, um, first speaker, who is, well, I lost my paper, that's, that's funny. Oh, here is it. Um, Terry Brown, who is uh, working in the uh, University of Warwick, UK, and who will speak about the ad admission into Cardiac Iris Center in England. Terry, the microphone is yours. Previous studies have indicated that survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest may be improved through direct transport of patients to cardiac arrest centres with PCI capability. In 2015, Ilcar concluded that these specialist centres may be effective despite a lack of high-quality data to support their implementation. And a recent systematic review concluded there is very low certainty evidence suggesting that post-cardiac arrest care at these centres is associated with improved survival, with favourable neurological outcomes at hospital discharge and improved survival to hospital discharge, but that there remains a need for high quality data, individual patient data meta-analysis and or data from randomised trials to fully elucidate the neurological outcome at discharge, especially those patients with shockable rhythms. Within the UK healthcare systems, there is limited evidence to support their benefit. In addition, there is no clear guidance to paramedics on who they should or should not convey. The aim of this analysis was to examine the pre-hospital factors that might influence the decision to convey a patient to a PCI capable hospital in England and the effect on survival. A retrospective cohort study was conducted using data from the UK's cardiac arrest registry for adults of presumed medical origin in 2017-2018. A cardiac arrest centre was defined as a PCI capable hospital and one that reported to the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society National Audit of PCIs. The study included 23,434 patients who were transported to hospital following an arrest. About 51% of these pages, patients were conveyed directly to a cardiac arrest centre. The mean and median age of patients conveyed was significantly lower than those not. A significantly lower proportion of patients over 65 years, 48.3%, were conveyed to compared, compared to the younger age patients, 57.1%, and significantly lower percentage of those conveyed were in the older age group. A greater proportion of those conveyed were confirmed to have arrested in a public location, and a fewer at home. Significantly more arrests that were conveyed had been witnessed by the EMS. There appeared to be no difference for bystander witness cases. Conveyed cases were also significantly more likely to have presented with a shockable rhythm. The ambulance response time of those conveyed was significantly shorter and a greater proportion of cases were attended to in under eight minutes from time of the initial 999 call. Of those that were conveyed, Significantly more cases had achieved Roscott Hospital handover and a greater proportion also survived to hospital discharge. Logistic regression analysis indicated that bystander witnessed, shockable rhythm, being aged 35 to 64 years and a response time of less than 8 minutes increased the odds that a cardiac arrest patient was conveyed or not. Bystander CPR increasing age and home arrest decreased the odds Surprisingly, so did Bitten in the Yutzling and Paragroup group. 
After adjusting for these variables, the odds of survival to hospital discharge for patients that were conveyed was 65% higher than those not conveyed. Despite the limitations in the data and analysis, this work has shown the case details of patients conveyed directly to a PCI-capable hospital are different from those not, and that these patients were more likely to survive to hospital discharge. There remains considerable uncertainty regarding the effects of cardiac arrest centres on survival for cardiac arrest in the setting of the National Health Service in England. There is no clear guidance as to whether patients should be transported to the nearest hospital or primary to a cardiac arrest centre. This analysis goes some way in highlighting the benefit of these centres, but more evidence is still required. Further more detailed analysis of the data has been carried out by Johannes von Vapulius Felt in Bristol and the results of the UK arrest trial due to end in 2022 will be interesting. And I would just like to now acknowledge the involvement of all these people, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Terry. Oops, still mute? No. Uh, do you hear me? I do, yes. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, and, well, thank you very much for the, this uh, presentation. Um, I have a question, maybe it's a misunderstanding. I, I saw on your graph that the um, um, chains of survival were uh, less important if the uh, victim received bystander CPR. Uh, there was no... Uh... The earth ratio was below one. It was that deep. was that was in that was when it when um hold on let me just pick up when when it's adjusted for all the other variables yes so it is the odds is below one I I, I mean I, it is surprising but that's how it came out of the in the analysis so when you adjust for it be the the uh, being bystander witness shockable rhythm and age and everything bystander CPI did not appear to be um beneficial. I don't. Could, could, it's could it's, it's not logical. Huh? Yeah. Could could you comment on that? I can't. I mean, it's, it, it was just surprise. I mean, I double checked the data, and I I double checked whether it, the Utstein comparator group being in the Utstein comparator group was correct as well. Um. And that surprised me. And I I I've, I I can't explain it really. It's perhaps I mean when it, when uh, Johannes produces his findings it might something might come out more detailed because he's done some uh, propensity score matching of cases uh, that were transferred and not transferred um, and he's due to sort of publish or oh, he's uh, writing the paper and due to uh, submit it for publication uh, within the next few months um, so Johannes might be able to shed some more light on if if the, if the findings are the same but I cannot explain why that why that is. Could it be um, related to the, the time to call the EMS system? There I might mean, there, there might be some interaction between the variables. I haven't looked at the interaction between so whether it's witnessed if if it was bystander witnessed and bystander CPR okay. um, cases. So that again, this is just a, a simple basic simple analysis. So there could be some interaction between uh, variables, but I did double check with uh, with the in the analysis whether there were any sort of um, uh, you know uh, interactions and also for collinearity between variables so uh, yeah I, I still can't explain why, why okay. that would happen. thank you I have uh, one other uh, question from the audience. Uh, who asked um, whole patient where were all patient transport at the CAC after Rusk or some of them at ALS in progress? Uh, it was both, yes. Yeah. So it, the, these were all all patients that were transferred to hospital, whether they were admitted with on with Rusk or ongoing CPR. Okay. Um, well, question are coming. Um, yeah, um, well, it, it could be also related to the uh, density of population, say uh, somebody, and uh, the uh, time to arrival of the ambulance. Yeah, yeah. 
and and, and the, sort of the distance between the hospital and and the location as well. Um, so yeah, we I mean we we plan to do some analysis on on that. Uh, we, Okay, thank you very much, Jerry. We okay. have to move on to the yeah. next speaker, Maria. Uh, hello, good afternoon. So, uh, next speaker is Gita Lindroth, who works in the EMS of Copenhagen and will present a nice uh, presentation about the use of live video streaming from bystander smartphone in out of hospital cardiac arrest. And, Gide, it's your turn. My name is uh, Gide Lindroth. Uh, and I'm from Copenhagen Emergency Medical Services. We have made it possible for the medical dispatcher to receive a live video during the emergency call. And in this study, we focus on the quality of CPR when live video has been used. The medical dispatchers are paramedics and special trained nurses, and they guide in CPR. In our protocol, they should guide in CPR, and after CPR is initiated, uh, they should ask bystander for a live video if there was more than two bystanders present and available smartphone. The system we used was a good sound. It works like this. The dispatcher sends a text message containing a link and when a bystander presses the, the link, the camera automatically opens and stream a live video to the medical uh, dispatcher. We wanted to focus on the quality of CPR. We evaluated this as soon as possible from the videos and compared it to after the medical dispatcher has used the live video for CPR guidance. The evaluations of the quality was done by a basic life support instructor and a physician. And if there was any disagreement, a third physician also evaluated the videos. Our primary focus was compressions, how they were performed, but we also uh, monitored other parameters of the CPR. We have collected 77 live videos with suspected cardiac arrest. We excluded 26 of them. Mainly, main reason for exclusion was that the patient was alive when the medical dispatcher received the live video. We ended up with 52 live videos with CPR. In these 52 cases, 90 bystanders performed CPR. The numbers are a bit different from the abstract because we uh, choose to exclude a video where parts of, it, uh, parts of the video were missing and afterwards included two new ca categorized cases. I would like to show you a real emergency call where video has been used for a CPR guidance. In the beginning of uh, the call, the video transmission has not been started yet. Uh, and please uh, do not share the video on social medias. And for the results, if you look at the x-axis, the first dots are before the medical dispatcher used the video for guidance, and the second dots are after the video instructions. And if you look at the y-axis, that is uh, the proportion of bystanders performing correct or improved uh, CPR. If you look at the dark blue and the orange, hand position and compression rate, it was uh, correct in approximately 50% of the bystanders and increased to around 80% after the video instructions. Compression steps were only correct in approximately 20% and this increased to 60%. The only thing that didn't improve was a recoil of thorax. Uh, ventilation was uh, only performed in 38% uh, of the cases and could only be evaluated in 6%. Hands up time was reduced in 38% of the cases. In 20%, there was a shift of the person performing compressions where it seemed like it was because of insufficient CPR. 
Agronet briefing could be uh, evaluated and was present in 26% of the cases. And in conclusion, in our setting, it seems like live video to the medical dispatcher could improve the resuscitation attempt by the bystanders. For the future, in my opinion, we have to look into when video should be used, how it should be used, and how it should be implemented in today's dispatch-assisted CPR protocol. Because today's protocol is, is totally based on verbal communication only. That was all for me, and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Gitte, for the nice presentation. Um, I would like to ask you one question uh, regarding, um, did you find out that, uh, how, how did you encourage the bystanders to uh, to the CPR and how did you obtain um, the consent of the patients or? Yeah. We had, uh, the bystanders had to start CPR before we started the video. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, of course, in some cases, um, uh, uh, they found out there was three cases where they realized it was cardiac arrest after the video started. But uh, from the beginning, uh, the bystanders would start CPR uh, and then they would start, start the live streaming if there was more than two bystanders present. Um, yeah, and then uh, of course it was only a few numbers of cardiac arrest where the live streaming was used, um, but that's also maybe because it's not a part of the dispatch protocol. Okay, and uh, also how could you assess the quality of the CPR, especially before the video was started? Uh, we uh, looked at the quality of CPR as soon as possible from the videos. So of course it was a bit difficult, but if you, as you saw in the video, the medical dispatcher uh, sees how she, she's doing, performing, and then she starts saying, you have to press hard or you have to do. So it was like the, uh, as soon as possible and how, how we, um, yeah, we looked at the quality. Of course it was a bit uh, difficult, but it was, uh, yeah, it was the way we could, uh, yeah, we could do it. So, um, so of course, uh, in the, um, if it's correct, it was uh, it was a bit difficult to see, but it was as as uh, as good as we could do it. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have a lot of questions coming from the audience. Um, Somebody is wondering about the legal status of the videos after um, they form. How. Do they form a part of the patient uh, record? Uh, of course, uh, they have a given written a, a concept to that I could use it, uh, in this. But uh, when they start the live stream, they have to accept uh, that they start the live stream. The first they have to press I accept. I do a live stream to the Copenhagen Medical Services. And then um, and afterwards, um, uh, yeah, they, they have to tell people around now I will start a video to the medical uh, services so, so people are informed. Uh, yeah, so they have to, uh, the caller has to press yes and they have to tell people around that they are recording. Okay, thank you very much. This is very fascinating. I hope you keep up the good work. Dominic, do you have any uh, further questions for Gide or shall we pass to the next speaker? Um, no, I just want to know if uh, all those dispatchers who are watching uh, those videos are debriefed and how they, they can handle that. Because it's not the same as being on the phone and watching directly what is happening. Uh, there are, um, I think one third of the uh, paramedics, so they drive uh, the ambulance two thirds of the time and one third of the time they are answering the uh, the handling of one one two emergency calls. Uh, I don't think the nurses uh, who say uh, out of the normal clinic, uh, they said it was uh, of course you feel a bit more that you are engaged to to the uh, because you can see it, but uh, there haven't been any issues yet about the um, uh, that it's a problem uh, for them. It's more that it's maybe a bit uh, it's an add on. It's uh, how you could put it in the communication that now I would like to. Uh, have a live stream and I'll 
text you a message and it's a very stressful situation but uh, even though it's it uh, they um, manage to do it in in these cases and where they also uh, uh, make better uh, cpr improve the cpr thank you very much um we'll move on to the next speaker uh rasmus linkby which is uh, sorry yeah, sorry. Um, Marius uh, Rasmus Lingby is presenting um, the use of real time ventilation feedback for out of hospital cardiac arrest and um, he's replacing Lyra Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Rasmus. Thank you to the ERC for accepting this abstract. On behalf of all the authors, I would like to present our simulation study on the use of real-time ventilation feedback for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Close to 700,000 people suffer from sudden out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the United States and Europe each year. Fewer than 15% of those treated by EMS survive to hospital discharge. CPR is essential to survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. In addition to high-quality chest compressions, ventilations must be delivered uh, to the patient at an appropriate rate and volume to optimize the flow of oxygenated blood to the vital organs and thereby avoid impairing interthoracic pressure. Previous studies have shown that paramedics tend to hyperventilate patients during CPR, which may increase the interthoracic pressure, compromising coronary perfusion pressure, and may lead to reduced survival. Previous studies have also shown that real-time feedback for chest compressions may improve guideline adherence. The aim of this study was to investigate whether real-time ventilation feedback would improve provider adherence to ventilation guidelines. We conducted a non-blinded randomized simulation trial enrolling 64 on-duty paramedics serving with Copenhagen EMS. Participants were randomized to real-time ventilation feedback or no ventilation feedback with 32 participants in each arm. After a standardized introduction, crews were conducting an eight-minute simulated out-of-hospital cardiac rest, shifting positions between ventilations and chest compressions every two minutes. Manual ventilation quality was measured using a Sol X-series defibrillator equipped with a differential pressure sensor, the Accuvent, attached between the back and the ET tube. Real-time ventilation feedback was shown as numerical and graphical items on the X-series displaying tidal volume to the left countdown to next ventilation and ventilation quality in the center, and rate per minute on the right. The results from our simulation trial. ERC guidelines recommend a tidal volume of 500 to 600 mils for each ventilation. We found that compliance with guideline recommendations for tidal volume reached 43.5% for control group, the intervention group reached a compliance of 75.1% for tidal volume. The ESC guidelines for ventilation rate on an intubated patient recommends a rate of 10 breaths per minute. We found that compliance with guideline recommendations for ventilation rate reached 57.8% for, for the control group the intervention group reached a compliance of 95.2% for ventilation rate. When combining the correct tidal volume and correct rate delivered simultaneously, we found that the control group performed correct ventilations in 24.5% of the delivered ventilations compared to a 72.5% by the intervention group. When controlling for participant covariates, um, we found that guideline adherence was 45.5% higher in participants receiving real-time ventilation feedback. 
We concluded that real-time ventilation feedback increases guideline compliance with both ventilation rate and tidal volume in a simulated out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Real-time feedback has the potential to improve manual ventilation quality and may also allow providers to avoid harmful uh, hyperventilation during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Rasmus. Um, I, for I forgot to, to present to you. So you are a paramedics from the critical care system of Copenhagen. Um, well, do, do you think, I have a question for you. Do you think you have, um, it is possible to use such a system on BMV, bag mass valve ventilation? Well, well, it, it depends because we had, uh, as you probably saw on the, on the pictures, the patient was intubated during the simulation trial. Um, and as we could see in, in the new guidelines um, uh, regarding airway uh, handling, whatever works will, will, will be sufficient for, for ventilating uh, patients in cardiac arrest. So, but if you, if you use a BVM with a face mask, as long as you keep the seal tight around the patient, you should be able to use the, uh, the feedback system uh, as well. But, but we didn't test that in this simulation trial. So it's, it's just a pragmatic uh, assumption. Okay, thank you. Maria, do you have a question? Yeah, I have one question uh, regarding the use of capnography in that case. Have you, have you used any portable capnographer to assess also the ventilation um, quality? No, uh, not in this trial. It was a simulation trial. So, so all we had to, to go, f uh, go from on the ventilation quality adjustments was the feedback dashboard. So we didn't use uh, um, entitled uh, CO2. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, Dominique? Or we, we, no, I don't have more questions. We can thank you very much, Rasmus. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Nice presentation, and we can go on to the next presentation. We move on to Hussein Albari, who is a PhD student from Saudi Arabia in the University of Birmingham and he will present the impact of bystander cardiopulmonary resuscitation for pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in England. And uh, the stage is yours. Happy to share with you our recent findings on the impact of bystander CBR for pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in England. Bystander CBR is a key factor that can make a positive impact on survival outcome and it is one uh, of a few factors that we can improve around the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The rate of bystander CBR varied across pediatric studies for different reasons, such as the lack of EMS dispatcher system, the absence of community education program, fear of responsibility, other reasons uh, related to the study design and the definition of pediatric age group, in England, we have limited data about the bystander CBR and its association with outcome. So we plan to we plan to describe the bystander rate and its association with risk and survival to hospital discharge for pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest in England. It is a retrospective analysis of prospectively uh, collected cohort within the out of hospital cardiac arrest registry data were collected from 11 emergency medical services and our population was a pediatric less than 18 years from January 2014 to November 2018. We have excluded cases with missing both standard CBR data or missing both outcomes. Uh, we also uh, collected other arrest characteristics and we use multivariable uh, logistic regression to examine the association between bystander CBR and outcomes. So after applying our exclusion criteria, we ended up with uh, 2,578 cases. Of those, 
65% had bystander CBR, but only 37 of those cases were witnessed. Uh, most common cause of arrest was medical cause, and we found shock. Uh, we found shock over rhythm in seven percent of the total cases. Arrest during daytime was thirty-five percent, and we defined uh, the daytime as the time from nine a.m. to five p.m. For the outcome, uh, twenty-four percent achieved risk, and eleven percent had survival hospital discharge. The bystander CBR uh, ranged from 61 to 70 percent in our data and this is considered high compared to other pediatric studies but we found a variation of the bystander rate across uh, regions ranging from 52 percent to 82 percent. Also we found uh, cases with trauma and witness arrest were less likely to receive bystander CBR and uh, more individuals uh, have shock over rhythm when bystander CBR performed. For the outcome, bystander CBR increased the chance of achieving ROSC, but uh, there was no association with uh, survival to hospital discharge. Uh, one of the important findings is that witnessed shock over rhythm asphyxia at daytime were associated with both outcomes. Bystander CBR was performed in two thirds of the pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest. But the issue is that there was a large proportion of those cases unwitnessed. And the uh, time before CBR started unknown and the time lag increase the chance of having poor outcome, which might partially explain our findings here. Uh, also, we found the rate varied across regions, so understanding the socioeconomic factors might help us to uh, understand the issue behind the variation across regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hussein, for the nice presentation. Uh, just, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the, um, how, how did you find out which regions are, uh, were less uh, keen to start by bystander CPR? So uh, we had the data from different EMS regions and uh, we know in each region how many uh, cases had bystander CVR compared to those who did not have bystander CVR. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question from the audience asking about uh, any difference between uh, non-shockable and shockable rhythm and the uh, roles uh, in the yeah. bystander CPR? Yes, yeah, so uh, shockable rhythm was associated with both outcomes positively. And also we found that shockable rhythm was uh, seen more in cases where bystander CBR performed. Mm -hmm. uh, Dominic, uh, as I understand, this is the field, uh, your field. So if you have any more questions regarding pediatric resuscitation. Well, I, I, I have a question uh, because um, you said 37% uh, of the uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest received bystander CPR. But in your uh, one of your last slides, you said two thirds of the pediatric uh, art of hospital cardiac arrest received bystander CPR. Maybe I missed something. Yeah, so the bystander CPR was 65%. Those cases had bystander CPR. But of those, there was only 37 witnessed. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much, Yusin. Uh, we will go on with the um, Nieves De Luca presentation. Um, Nieves is working in the summer Protection Civil de Madrid, and she is also a member of the ERC uh, Pediatric Working Group, uh, who is actually working on Guidelines 2020. 
uh, and she is um, a member of the University of Madrid. And she will speak first of all uh, about the long-term prognosis according to the rhythm before the first rusk in pediatric out of hospital and emergency department cardiac arrest. Thank you so much for the effort to celebrate the meeting. And now I will present the study long-term prognosis according to the rhythm before the first return of spontaneous circulation in pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and emergency department cardiac arrest. It has widely studied the prognosis value of the first known rhythm in cardiac arrests which is better in sockable rhythms and bradycardia and worse in asystole. However, few is known about the prognosis value of the first rhythm before the return of spontaneous circulation. So we aim to find it out in pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrests and emergency department cardiac arrests. We developed an observational multicenter prospective study in children with emergency department cardiac arrests or out-of-hospital cardiac arrests from March 2014 to March 2020, collecting data of their cardiac arrest and their outcomes, including survival to hospital discharge, survival at six months, and POPC, pediatric overall performance category, at six months. In this scale, from 1 to 6, a good overall outcome is got with a score of 1 or 2. We collected 273 children. 81.7% were out of hospital cardiac arrests. Median age 2.5 years old. 201 of them achieved return of spontaneous circulation and 170 had sustained return of spontaneous circulation. We knew the rhythm before the first return of spontaneous circulation in 135 children. 48% were asystole, 24% bradycardia, 15% pulseless electrical activity, 10% ventricular fibrillation, and 3% pulseless ventricular tachycardia. If we analyze a rhythm before the first return of spontaneous circulation, we found that asystole, 65 patients, was significantly associated to lower survival to hospital discharge, with odds ratio 1.47 of bad outcome, and to lower survival at 6 months, with odds ratio 1.38. We didn't find any association with good overall outcome at six months. Bradycardia, found in 32 patients, was significantly associated with the three outcomes, with a ratio of 0 0.53, 0 0.59, and 0 0.72 of bad outcome, respectively. We couldn't find any significant association between parallel electrical activity or sockable rhythms and the three outcomes. We could conclude that in children with emergency department cardiac arrest or out of hospital cardiac arrest, regarding to the rhythms before the first return of spontaneous circulation, and six months outcome, asystole was associated to lower survival, bradycardia was a prognosis factor of higher survival and good overall outcome, and sockable rhythm or parallel electrical activity were not found long-term prognosis factors. Then we should consider that the prognosis value of the rhythms in cardiac arrest is not the same along the resuscitation and the rhythm before the first return of spontaneous circulation should be registered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nieves. Um, I have a, 
a question probably uh, obvious for everybody. Have you made a link between the, um, the first rhythm and the last rhythm before Rusk? Um, are there changes or um, are there many changes? And can we relate the prognosis to both different rhythms? Yes, uh, mm, of course, uh, there are changes because in our study, uh, Two years ago, we studied the relationship between the first rhythm and the outcomes. Uh, and now we are studying only the, the rhythm just uh, before the first rhythm of continuous circulation. And the results are different. Uh, I think uh, a reason may be that uh, uh, obviously it, it changes. But a uh, 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 sockable rhythm is uh, only precious if it is uh, if we we can found uh, find it uh, in the first moment. So the cardiac arrest. I am not sure if I have. We haven't studied uh, the changes, but it it would be very interesting. I think in another study. Okay, thank you. Maria, do you have a question? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you very much, Nervous, for the nice presentation. Shall we move on to the next one of Neves about uh, effect of bicarbonate administration on the outcome in children in cardiac arrest? Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you for being here and thank you to all who are doing their best. I'm going to present a study about the effect of bicarbonate administration in children in cardiac arrest. We know that sodium bicarbonate is usually recommended as treatment in case of blood acidemia with a low pH or a high blood lactate. However, there are no studies to support this recommendation in children. We aim to detect whether children in cardiac arrest with a low blood pH or a high blood lactate who receive intravenous sodium bicarbonate had a better outcome. So, we developed an observational multicenter prospective study in children with emergency department cardiac arrest or out of hospital cardiac arrest from March 2014 to March 2020, collecting data of their cardiac arrest and outcome, including pediatric overall performance category at six months. In this scale from one to six, a good overall outcome is got with a score of one or two. So we have 273 cardiac arrests. 81.7% were out of hospital cardiac arrests. Median age 2.5 years old. And 112 out of 273 patients were treated with sodium bicarbonate. When we analyze these 112 patients, we found that those who got return of spontaneous circulation received less frequently bicarbonate. The use ratio of bad outcome was 4.5. It was similar for patients with hospital discharge. The O ratio of bad outcome was 4.1. And for patients with a good overall outcome at six months, they also receive less frequently bicarbonate. The O ratio was 3.5. In the last slide, we didn't discriminate if there could have been an indication for the treatment, like acidemia. So we studied separately this kind of patients. We had 124 patients with pH under 
when patients receive bicarbonate because of pH under 7.10, they achieved return of spontaneous circulation less frequently. The O ratio of Ebola.com was 4.5. Regarding to other outcomes, hospital discharge and POPC 1 or 2 at 6 months, while we had a small disadvantage for children who received bicarbonate, the difference was no significant. Considering only children with lactate over 10 millimoles per liter, 98 cardiac arrests, all of the outcomes were slightly worse if they received bicarbonate, but without statistical significance. We may conclude that in children with emergency department cardiac arrest or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, sodium bicarbonate is administered more frequently when acidemia is present, but we do not detect an improvement in patients with a low, blood, a low blood pH or a high blood lactate regarding to return of spontaneous circulation, survival to discharge, or good overall outcome at six months with this treatment. Thank you so much for your attention. You can send me any comments to my email. Thank you very much, Neves, for the nice presentation again. Uh, there was uh, a question from the audience since two days ago regarding um, the bicarbonate in the outcomes and uh, he's wondering if the results were adjusted uh, for the CPR, with the CPR duration. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, we usually uh, could consider uh, administering bicarbonate in both cases with a long CPR or uh, when the patient has acidemia, metabolic acidemia. And uh, in this study, we have uh, analyzed only one of the circumstances. Uh, but, but of course, uh, it is uh, something that could change the result of the study. I would like, I would be delighted uh, if uh, I present next year a multivariant study because it is only a bivariant study. And I think uh, it would be better if we could analyze all the um, confounding factors in, in, in this uh, kind of registry. True, and I think there might be a lot of confounding factors in this kind of studies. Dominique, do you have any further questions to Nevis? Yes. Um, when you, you take in account uh, the, the blood pH, did you take in account the fact that it was venous or arterial? Uh, uh, in this study, uh, I, we haven't analyzed if it was uh, from venous or arterial or uh, capillar sample, but uh, we studied previously in uh, the correlation between pH uh, from different samples and the outcome, and it was very similar. Uh, so uh, it is not, I think it is not really important in, in this study, but in a, in a, a future study, uh, also I think it would be interesting. Right, but it's probably very difficult to standardize uh, the, the way of uh, doing the pH in, in such circumstances. Mm, well, we frequently use a handheld device uh, and it, it, we have the results only in five minutes. It could be difficult, but it is possible. Okay, very good. Any other question? Maria, do you have any other questions for Nieves? No. Um, I think we, ha we still have uh, 10 minutes um, and maybe we, we can go on with some of the question because uh, we haven't finished. For example, for Gita, Gita, are you there? <laughs> um, there? There were several questions about- I'm, I'm here. Yeah, okay. 
There were several questions about um, the position of the, um, the, the, the mobile, mobile uh, during the CPR. Do you instruct people how to place them? When we trained the uh, medical dispatcher, they were instructed uh, to ask the bystander uh, with the phone to start to watch the hand position, then stand a bit, a bit backward, and then film uh, how the compression stick was. But in reality, <clears throat> they were often the camera was moving around and the middle dispatcher only received one day of training. So, um, so even though we had instructions, it was different from uh, in these, uh, in these uh, categorized cases. But I guess for the future, we have to find out how we instruct the medical dispatchers in the best way to guide bystanders. That's a still a, a huge issue. Right, but we are speaking about positioning the uh, mobile. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time, the bystander with the phone was holding the phone, filming, and they were walking around. So it was different a uh, position of the uh, resuscitation attempt that was uh, filmed. Um, so yeah, but I guess for the future, we should train the medical dispatcher. And how do we um, train uh, I ask the bystanders to film in the best way? How should we do it? Because um, when we first trained the dispatcher, we thought that uh, you can stand on the other side filming, but often there's more bystanders present and they're on both sides of the patient and around. So in some cases, it's a bit difficult to get a good view of the resuscitation attempt. Uh, yeah, so we learn from reality and yeah, and now we have to figure out how we, yeah, what we should do forward. Um, okay, thank you. And then it was a question about, uh, yeah, the, the Italian have uh, done such a thing and they ask for uh, the confidentiality and we use four the values. Sorry, can I have the question again? Yeah, yeah, uh, about confidentiality, uh, because of course there is no consent, I presume, but the fact that they, they accept the link is a sort of uh, acceptation. And do you store, normally, do you store the uh, videos? Or, or? Yeah, we, we discussed that. And for and now we store the videos and we are, we are in a way, say that it's just a... a, a as, yeah, it's the audio recording and the video. So uh, we also store the audio recording and then we just say it's a, a, a supplement to the audio recording. But they, as I said, they had to give the consent and they also told uh, where it's, that it's saved and, and they, yeah. Okay, I'm just watching what? it. Yeah. Oh. I was, uh, I found on one more question for Gide uh, about um, if there was any delay in the bystander CPR uh, while setting up the phone. Uh, in our setting, the CPR should always start it before we started the live streaming. So the guidance CPR and when they are like have guided the first round for, uh, yeah, uh, said all the things that they should from the protocol, you have to have your arm stretched, you have to, and then they should start the video. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course it's also, um, yeah, we can discuss what time, but in our setting, we didn't want to have delay uh, in, in the beginning of the CPR. So, so this was only to evaluate the CPR to see, can it be, can it be better? So it has to be started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dominic, do you have any more questions uh, of Gite or uh, I have one for Husin here? If you don't have any more for uh, Gite. Dominic? Are you, ah. Okay, so uh, Husin, I have one question for you from the audience about um, the quality. Did, did you manage to assess the quality of bystander CPR uh, during uh, those uh, pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, data about the, the quality of CBR. So we were not able to assess it. 
So, so one, that could be a confounding factor of, of the results. Of course, yeah. All right. And uh, uh, anything? Are there any questions yeah. from the speakers, maybe, to others, to the, to the others? Good, Dan. I think we have uh, made it. Thank you very much to everybody and to my co-presenter. Uh, um, but thank you for this really uh, excellent session, I think. And uh, well, we will meet again, I hope, in the next sessions. Bye-bye uh, to, to all of you and uh, see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much and keep up the good work to everyone. Good Thank afternoon. You.